All right, here we go. Hello, all of you in online land. This is the face-to-face -face quantitative research methods class. Today we're talking about part two of survey research methodology. Uh, the other day we talked about some of the different points of doing survey research. Today we're going to get a little bit more in-depth with it. Okay? So, with the survey research method, you need to start with your research question, your hypothesis. Obviously, why is that? So you know the direction of your study. So you know who your population is going to be. So you know what kinds of questions you're asking and how to form your survey. Because you want to make sure the questions that you ask on the survey are going to answer your research questions. Okay? You want to find out who's the pop who that population is, whether it's going to be the entire population or whether it's going to be a representative sample. Okay. Today we're going to talk about questionnaire construction. This is what we talked about the other day. But today we're going to talk about the questionnaire construction because believe it or not, that visual part of it does play a lot into it. We're also going to talk about the collection of data, the analysis of data, and the presentation of data. Okay? Two of my primary aspects of questionnaire construction is the question development. First of all, again, you need to make sure that those questions that you're asking answer your research question or hypothesis. Um, here, I believe it was you, that's a, your, for your final project, you want to use the communication apprehension scale, mm -hmm. and you're looking at peer tutoring and things? Yep. Okay. Well, if you're going to be doing, your research questions are centered on, say for example, and by the way, yours, the way I was reading it, read more like an experiment than a survey, but that's fine for our purposes today. If you are asking questions about their apprehension, your questions in the actual survey need to deal with, are you apprehensive when this happens? Does this make you feel uncomfortable? Do you feel more comfortable in this instance? That's going to come back to a research question of, are juniors more apprehensive about public speaking than sophomores, or something along those lines, okay? Um, you need to think about the level of data collection. What do we mean by that? Like how much data you're actually getting from the survey? Yes, but more specific than that. Remember we talked about the levels of variables, the levels of data. One of them was nominal. What are the others? Um, ordinal. Ordinal. Um, ratio. ratio is the highest level. Interval, that's the fourth one. Interval, okay? So you need to think about how high a level of data are you trying to get. Are you trying to find rankings? Are you just trying to find demographics? Are you trying to find if there's an absolute zero and where they're going to fall on that scale? Okay. You need to think about do you want to have more open or closed-ended questions? On a survey, what do we want to have more of? Closed. Closed. Why? Because it gives you a direct answer. It gives you a direct answer. We're looking for a very specific response. Yes, no. On a scale of one to five, where are you? So we know we can we can start comparing means and that sort of thing. Okay, that's where we can start doing more of our inferential statistics. Okay, um, and then you need to think about: is it a single item or is it a constructor scale that we're trying to develop? What do you think this means? The single item versus the constructor scale. So is it like a yes/no question or like a Likert type scale? No. Good idea, though. They can, now, you can use yes, no's, or Likert type scales in both areas, okay? A single item would be something like, what is your year in school? What is your gender? Uh, what is your average household income? That sort of thing. You're only looking for one specific answer, and that's all you're going to use with it, okay? Demographics are going to be single items. Constructs or scales is where you're trying to find out, for example, with the communication apprehension. There's a range, if you're in these, this range, you are high apprehension. If you're in this range, you're medium apprehension. If you're in this range, you're low apprehension. So it sounds like there's three levels, but you've got, what is it, 24 questions on that scale? Is that right? You've got 24 questions you're answering. And questions 1, 2, 7, 9, 11, whatever, are going to if you have a high score there, that's going to put you in this range. If you have a medium score on these questions, it's going to put you in this range. I'm going to share with you, um, when we get into doing the statistics, Blake and Mouton's managerial grid. 
and it looks at, man, at, at leadership style from four different ranges, okay? And it's got a list of questions, and you're, you're trying to find those scores. You're constructing what that range is, what that level is, high, medium, low, okay? Your question layout and order also needs to be considered. The first thing we're looking at is length. What do we mean by that? Are we talking about the length of the paper? Length of time it takes to complete it? Number of questions? What are we looking at? All of the above. All of the above. Okay. Length of paper is kind of a minor one, but I mean, if, if you roll out there with a toilet paper roll and you have questions on all this thing, people are going to freak out a little bit. Okay. Um, no, we're talking more about how many questions there are, okay? Because if you have 100 questions, that's a long survey. We're also talking about the types of questions. If you have 100 questions and 25 of them are open-ended, that's a really long survey. Because it goes beyond, I just have to put, to put one number for my age, my income, my gender, my location and then pick and put on a range of one to five on all these other areas. So you need to think about the length of your survey. Why is that important? We talked about respondent fatigue. Yeah, the respondent fatigue factor. If it's too long, they're gonna get tired of answering it. Okay, and you're not gonna get good results. We also look at visual appeal. Why, really, why, why can't we just do a Word document and have the question over here and the scale over here? Why do we need to think about the visual appeal? To draw attention to the survey. Draw attention to the survey. Why else? If it's more appealing, we might be more interested. It looks more professional. If it looks more professional, maybe then it's more important, more valuable. If it's more valuable, maybe then all you know, that inherent value placed on it, then maybe I'll spend more time on it. Okay. Why else? Why is that visual appeal more? Gives a flow, so you can kind of go from one to the next. Especially okay. when you have that bar at the top or somewhere where they can gauge yeah. their progress. Yeah. If it's, a, if it's an online one, mm -hmm. where they've got the bar at the top, mm -hmm. and you can say this is page one of seven, these are questions 10 through 15 of 50, those types of things. Okay. Visual appeal, also think about how hard it is to read really small print. Mm -hmm. And really small print when you've got um, you know, all of its white uh, the whole page is white and you've got black print, it starts to kind of run together. Or you've got dark backgrounds, you want to try and do something different, so you do a bar dark background and reverse text, the white text. Is that easy to read? Not really. Okay, so you don't want to necessarily do that with your, with your survey. You might want to do something like that as a header to draw attention, but not with the survey. Okay. So general guidelines when you think about it, relevant, uh, is it relevant to the goals of the study? Is this survey going to be relevant to the goals of the study? Okay. Again, all the items, and I keep coming back to this, that should stress to you how important it is. How relevant are the questions to your research question or hypothesis? Sometimes when you do a survey, you're going to do some data mining. You may or may not use that information on this study. Okay. Now, if you don't have a research question that goes with it, you don't want to put that into the study. You might say in your conclusions, we also looked at this, but that's a study for another time. Okay. You want to make your questions clear. Premium apps are way better than light ones. How clear is that question? What does that mean? What are premium apps? And what is way better? Huh? Right. Hence the reason we put the, the red X in there. We don't want to do that. Smartphone applications that one pays for are typically better than free smartphone applications. Ah, so a premium app is a smartphone app that I'm going to pay for versus one that's free. Now I see the difference. That's so I can actually compare these two things. You also want to keep your items short. When watching television, one often tends to wonder, one wander away from the actual screen and focus on other items and issues. Do you find this to be true of yourself? What? Again, don't do that. My mind wanders when watching television. Agree to disagree, one to five. Yeah, I'm curious.
here where you know they just said it's not even a question, mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily have to be a question. As long as you give them, as whenever you set up your scale, you give them the, the ranges. Okay. Don't ask the double barrel questions. Bossy or Kira said this the other day when we were talking. Public service announcements, PSAs, produced by government and corporations are not trustworthy. That should be a period, not a question mark. Okay. So who are, how's it double barrel? What are we talking about? Public service announcements produced by government and corporations are not trustworthy. Can't governments and corporations? Yeah, these are two separate entities. So what do you do to fix that? Two separate questions. Two separate questions. Public service announcements produced by the government are not trustworthy. Public service announcements produced by corporations are not trustworthy. Just make it into two questions, plain and simple. Avoid the biased words or terms. Isn't gratuitous violence on television horrible? <laughs> You're leading them somewhere. Obviously, I think this, right? It's very obvious that I as a researcher think this. And again, when we talk about research, one of the things we have to avoid is letting our bias slide in. Just like being a journalist, right Andy? Don't let that bias get in there, okay? There's a high level of a gratuitous violence on television. Again, agree to disagree. If they strongly agree, obviously, and I, this may be my bias. I may feel this way. I just did a thesis where it was very clear what the person thought about broadcast television news. Okay? Broadcast television, that's kind of redundant, isn't it? Broadcast news. It was very clear how she felt about it. That's okay to have that bias. You're human. That happens. But don't let it get into your study. Write the question in such a way that agree to disagree. And if they all say five, that if they strongly agree, huh, well, you know, they all agree with me. Avoid the leading questions. Don't you think that name calling in families is acceptable? Very, very similar to the last one, but. Engaging in name calling with family members is acceptable. Agree to disagree. The other day we went to a concert. We took a couple of my kids' friends. My daughter called me a butthead. I said, oh, maybe we should stop doing that in the house. <laughs> I wasn't being one either, by the way. <laughs> Avoid the highly detailed questions. Your participants might not know what it is you're talking about, so if you're asking them technical questions with very technical jargon, technical terms, they may not know what you're talking about. Okay, so how many times have you texted on your phone in the past 17 days? They may not have a clue, all right? So that, and this goes beyond just the technical jargon. This is more like in, your last, in the past 17 days, how many times have you texted on your phone? I delete my texts probably three, four times a day. I don't know. When did you start talking? <laughs> I don't know, but I haven't stopped since. <laughs> don't ask embarrassing questions unless it is central to the research. And this is where you're going to get stuck by IRB, the Internal Review Board. This is where, if you're asking really embarrassing questions, that's going to raise a red flag for IRB. And it's going to slow down your process of getting your survey approved so you can actually, so you can actually do the study. How much money do you make? Please identify which category best represents your household's level of income. And that's where you give the 0 to 10,000. 10,001 to 12 to 15,000 or 20,000. Okay, that's where you start giving them ranges, and they don't have to be specific, they can give you that range. So, in other words, in review, is are your questions relevant to the goals of the study? You want to make them clear, you want to keep them short, you don't want to ask the double barrel questions, you want to avoid the biased words or terms, the leading questions, the highly detailed questions. Any embarrassing questions? With that, any questions? That was pretty obvious. But when you start writing survey questions, you're going to find yourself going back and doing these, and then you're going to go, oh, crap. I didn't even think about that. Every time I've taught this class, every time I've developed a survey myself, I've gone through this myself, I've gone back and looked and thought, oops, and you have to go back and fix it. So what level or, level or category of data should I collect? 
I want those closed ended or forced responses, so they're going to have to give me some specifics. For demographics, knowledge, attitudes, behaviors, I want them to tell me what is your belief, what is your attitude, what do you do. On average, how many times a week do you X? And I'm going to give them a range, 0 to 5, 6 to 10, and I want them to hit in one of those areas. Why is that important? Why do we want those specific answers? Why do we want the forced responses? It's easier to quantify. It's easier to quantify. I can start looking for averages. I can start looking for ranges. I can start seeing if I can categorize individuals. Okay. If I find out that um, consumers ages 18 to 21 are more apt to buy on Fridays than consumers 22 to 30, I'm going to market my products and really put up bigger displays on a Friday for the 18 to 21 year olds to try and drive them to buy on those days. If they don't buy Monday through Wednesday, I'm not going to waste my marketing efforts on them Monday through Wednesday. They impact the data analysis. Remember, the categorical data is going to give us our frequencies. Okay? The rankings, the intervals are going to allow us to find means, they're going to find, help enable us to find standard or not means, numbers are going to enable us to find standard deviations. Mathematical properties, the ratio again is going to be able to give us some of those as well. But remember, here we have the, the absolute zero. Okay. Make sense? How about you in online land? Got any questions? <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Wait, I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. I guess I don't understand the difference between the interval and the ratio. If interval it's and ratio? The same mathematical no. property. Here you're actually going to have an absolute zero. Okay, think about we think about temperature and we ha and we think well it's zero degrees it's an absolute zero, not so much because you go negative you go the other way. There has to be no existence whatsoever. Okay. Remember with the rankings you can get first, second, third, but think about a, a race. First can be five seconds ahead of second but second can be 15 seconds ahead of third, so there's that gap. Interval, you're going to have equal spacing between. Ratio is just that one step further where there is an absolute zero. Remember, when you're using categorical data, you need to be exhaustive. Who's your favorite person to talk with when you need advice? My significant other, my friend, my mom, my dad probably go more in depth here. My priest, my counselor, my teacher, therapist. therapist. So make sure you're exhausted. Why is that? Because if you're not, you just leave it to other, then that opens up yeah. the categories you have to. If I survey 100 people, I could have 5 here and 10 here, and somebody's going to have to help me with the math here. 8 here, that's 23, and uh, 10 here, that's 33, and I've got another. I'm stuck with 67 and another, and I still don't have a clue who they're talking to. Okay, you want to be exhausted. What happens if you don't have another and you just have these? They're forced to pick one, and that may not necessarily build to you your data. Yeah. Who is your favorite person to talk to? Well, none of these people. Now, you could rework that question and say, of those listed below, who are you most likely to talk to? But that's forcing you to change your question. Why not give your categories, make them exhaustive, so that they have to fill that in? It also needs to be mutually exclusive. Who's your favorite person to talk to when you need advice? Family member, spouse, mom, friend, what's the problem here? Well, some people would consider, well, yeah, mom and spouse could both be family members. Yeah. So they're not mutually exclusive. Well, family member, but that's my mom. That, okay. I mean, you don't have father on there or yeah. anything like that. So. And my spouse is my best friend, so Aww. that's sweet. <laughs> so, you know. Cut that from the tape. Huh? Cut it from the tape. Cut that from the tape? No, I'm going to show it to her. <laughs> Look what I said in class. <laughs>
spouse, mom, friend, other family member, or other. Now again, we're not going very exhaustive here, and we would probably need to change the, the question, but you get the idea. Okay. For ranking or rank order, in rank order, please describe the topics you discuss with your significant other. Relationship issues, work issues, school issues, social issues, other. So you're ranking them, and they're going to make it clear, and this is one way, one reason why you need to make your questions very clear. You need to make it very clear that they know to fill all of those in. One, four, two, five, three. And then you can leave them a blank that they can fill in. You may find out if you do the other and you give them space to fill it in, you could come up with more data and you start finding out, oh, 20 different times they're talking about the car, and 15 times they're talking about household chores, and those become more categories for you. So if you're looking at space issues, yes, other is helpful as long as you give them the space to fill it in. But the point I'm making on this, this statement here is make sure it's clear that they know to rank them. Okay? And I tell you right now, it doesn't matter how many times, in rank order, bold, all caps, underline, they're still going to go check. You know, or worse, check, check. And you get those and you're like, do you not read? Am I talking to one of my freshman classes here? Come on, help me out. You know, that's what's going to happen. Most of them are going to answer right. Okay? You know what I'm talking about. I don't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're working on your dissertation or your thesis and you're really counting on this data so you can get everything, they're not answering it right. Yeah, it's frustrating. A little bit. Okay. With interval, you can use the Likert type scale. And again, we talked last time about doing the odds, five or seven point scale. And why would you want to use the odd scales, odd numbers? Because of a neutral option. Because then they have that neutral option or that middle option, and that's going to help you make that nice bell shaped curve. Okay, why wouldn't you want the odd, the even, the four or six point? Because it even forces them to take a stance. It's going to force them to take a stance. And that's just going to be personal preference. Maybe you work with that with your advisor, and they give you some direction on, hey, you know, we're, this is really exploratory. I'm not sure that we're going to be able to force a stand here. Maybe we ought to just aim for that bell-shaped curve and go with that. So there's pros and cons to both of them. Communication department's website has useful information for students. One, strongly agree, to five, strongly disagree. And they can come in here neither. Okay. Or you force them to go one way or the other. I would say with an even, if you're really trying to make a difference and trying to make a change and you just really need to know, where are we? Do most agree or most disagree? Go with the even. Semantic differential does not give you the numbers. It just gives you the scale. Okay, so you have the bipolar adjectives, happy or sad, and where are you on the scale? All right. My advisor for my dissertation said one time he wants to try using a ruler and laying out like six inches. You know, with all the six and a half, six and four, six and three quarter, and have them mark on the ruler where they are, just to see if you can get even more data from them, just giving them blanks so they can check where they are. I think that would be kind of interesting. But I mean, basically, what are you going to end up with? Or no, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't the, the ruler, it was just a straight line. And you marked on the line, and then he was going to take his ruler and put it over it and get the number that way, because it takes all the numbers out of it. That's what it was. Be really interesting because you're really going to see, well, they don't have a number to go with, they don't have a space to fill in, so they're going to have to just mark on the line how far down they are, and then you take the ruler to assign the numbers. What's the downside of that? I have to measure every one of those lines from this survey times 200 surveys, or however many surveys I've got.
open-ended responses. Where are they going with that? <laughs> I don't remember where I was going with the open-ended responses. Open-ended responses are going to be able to, if they don't answer, that there's your zero. If they just don't give you a response, there's your zero. Or they say no comment or never experienced or something like that, that's your zero. They don't have a level. And then when you get the other responses is when you start coding. Okay, and that's how you get your measurements. Does that make sense? So if they skip a question, you know, don't answer an open-ended, do you just throw out that specific question or do you throw out the entire survey? That's a great question, Savannah. That's, it depends. If they just skip that question or maybe they skip a couple or they don't answer any of the open-ended but they answer all the closed-ended, you're probably going to use that survey. If they skip an entire section, you toss it. Why do you think that is? Give you an inconsistent result. Why? You're right. Why? Because they didn't answer all the questions. <clears throat> okay. And if they're not taking it serious enough to answer all of the questions, what? That's one point. They're not taking it seriously enough. So if they're not taking it seriously enough, how, how am I to know they didn't just you know, just mark through it. What else happens? The number of respondents per question is different. The number of respondents, well, yeah, you just, you figure that when you do your, your means, SPSS or Excel will do this for you. It'll just, it'll give you the average number based on the number of responses you got. So that's not as critical. But if you, if, if I'm taking a survey and certain questions are about, let's say, family, and the other half of the questions are about my job, and they answer all the questions about my job, and I meet the family, then it, you, you may skip a section that you're trying to see if there's any correlation between these two. And now I can't because you left this whole thing out. Well, this point's useless then, right? The other thing goes back to what we talked about in the beginning, the respondent fatigue. Well, if you didn't fill out 25 sections or 25 questions, you're not going to be as fatigued as the person who did all 60. Right? So that's going to skew some things. So if they skip a whole lot of stuff, pitch it. If they don't answer the open-ended questions, you know, in my survey, when I had, again, I had 100 questions that I asked, and I got 2,000-some responses on it, there were a good number of them who didn't do any of the open-ended questions. That was okay. They did everything else. I only had two open-ended questions anyway. You, again, that's, what, that's one of the reasons you don't want a lot of open-ended questions on the survey. If you're going to ask a whole lot of open-ended questions, do a qualitative study. All right, single item or construct scale. Attitudes toward presidential debates. I like to watch presidential debates. Okay, so you're going to get a response to whether people like to watch them or not. With the construct, you're going to have multiple questions in that same area. An example would be the communication apprehension scale, like we talked about. Okay, so this is my single item. I like to watch presidential debates. Now, if I were doing a construct on... Um, interest in political discussion, I might have 15 questions that deal with presidential debates and uh, political news talk shows and vice presidential debates and watching um, presidential news conferences. And I'm going to take all of those answers and if I score between uh, and instead of using the strongly agree to disagree, I'm going to actually have numbers here for that. And if I score between an average of 4.1 and 5, then I like watching, or I like political discussion. If it's a number between uh, 3 and 4, I sort of like it, that sort of thing. So you're just, you're trying, you're taking all these 15 questions to find one answer. Does that make sense? Multiple items or constructs. Number one, you need to think about the reliability of the scale. Okay. Do the participants answer similar items in a similar manner? Are they getting all these questions about politics and the, the questions about the presidential debates and the vice presidential debates and those types of things? Are they answering those one way and then the questions about political news are answering all of those questions in a similar fashion? Does that make sense? But you have to make sure that it's reliable that they're actually following in that pattern. 
Chromebox Alpha is what we look for when we're talking about inter uh, surveys and looking at reliability. It's on a zero to one scale, and if it's 0.7 or higher, it's reliable. And again, SPS will figure this for you. SPSS will figure this for you. With open-ended questions, remember we've talked about open-ended items. Most of, general, general, good, most of your general guidelines are going to apply. Again, use them very judiciously. If you're going to ask 10 to 15 open-ended questions, what kind of studies should you be doing, Andy? Qualitative. What kind of qualitative? Um, you had me last semester. Yeah. Um, I always just really liked uh, the, uh, the one that I did. in-depth interviews. Yeah. If you're going to ask a whole bunch of open-ended questions, you might as well do open-ended interviews, or uh, uh, in-depth interviews, because you want to get their depth, that you want to get a lot of depth in their responses, you want to kind of read their body language and things, okay? This is quantitative research methods. Don't use a lot of open-ended. If you do have the open-ended questions, make sure you provide plenty of space, and even when you're doing these online, it gives you a, a code that you can punch in there, when you're setting it up, that tells you how many lines of text they can put in. And if you give them three lines of text, you're going to force them to get to the point quickly. Okay? Um, think if you do Twitter, they got 140 characters to tell their story there. All right? You need to decide what am I going to do with this data? Is it just going to be for some meat? Or is it going to be uh, manipulation checks like what I was using it for? Are you going to take that data and then code it and then do this thing to do with it? Please describe the most recent interaction with your immediate supervisor and your level of satisfaction with the interaction. Now this is an open-ended question that I would turn into two. Whenever you see an and and you go from talking about the most recent interaction and your level of satisfaction, now I'm going to have to wade through all of this to get both responses. Okay, Make it two questions. But with that question, what am I going to do with this? I'm going to find out, I've got 15 people who respond to this. Please describe the most recent interaction with your immediate supervisor, and they may just say it stunk, or it was sad, it was um, productive. That may be all you get. Well, are you going to just code those? Are you going to code either more in-depth responses and try and come up with productive, unproductive, that sort of thing? Um, are you looking for them to give you? My last interaction happened last year. It was after a negative situation with a colleague, and my boss brought me in, and we talked for a long, a long time about this. We came up with some strategies of how to deal with it, and it was a very productive, a very productive study. I would view my supervisor as a servant leader, something along those lines. Now, what am I doing with that? Am I just going to use that as meat? You know, to kind of give some narrative to all the numbers to break it up a little bit. You know, if I've got 2,000 people who responded to my survey and only 15 answered the open-ended questions, I could say some responses looked like this, but it's really not going to give me that much detail. So you have to figure out quickly what you're going to do with it. Okay? With your layout, first of all, give the instructions. What all do you think you should include in your instructions? Define any terms that they may be unfamiliar with. Define any terms they're unfamiliar with. Good. What else? Any abbreviations as far as the scale? Explain any abbreviations or scales. Okay. There's instructions for the survey, and then as you go to each different section, you're going to give instructions there as well. Okay, so that's where you would probably give your discussion, like a, uh, what do they call that? A legend for the abbreviations. Yeah. Okay. Would you want to know the purpose of the study, who's conducting it, why, and how many questions, and how long it should take? Any questions? Well, I mean. No, you're right. Okay. Oh. <laughs> you just covered it all. Well, then do you all What's the purpose of the study? Who's conducting it? How many questions there are? How long it should take? Let them know that their participation is vital to providing this information. Okay. It's a fine line because you don't want to try to taint them. Like in my instructions, I didn't want to say, I'm trying to determine. Um, variables that will lead sports information directors to having more influence in their organizations. I didn't want to go into that much detail because I didn't want them thinking the whole time they're taking it, okay, 
what would give me more influence? I wanted to know where they were now. All right. Your question order. Again, we talked about you may want to start off with your demographics first, kind of ease them into it, get them comfortable with doing the study, and then go with the easy questions, um, put the easiest questions up front, and then work the more difficult ones, more intimate, personal items later. Okay? There's another school of thought that says go reverse because the easy items when you're fatigued are going to be easier to answer. The demographics, put them at the end. They're going to be easier to answer. When I'm tired, I can get to those pretty easily. Okay. Now, most people I've ever talked to and the classes I've ever taken, intimate, personal items, do save those to later. I mean, if you start off with how much do you weigh, that might. Can we get to that later? Can, can I get into the study? And then again, think about the visual appeal. The more professional visually it is, the better. What do you think about this one? A lot of heads shaking in here. Why not? Yeah, I'm constantly going to have to be going. Definitely agree is here. Uh, agree with it because I'm reading the question down here, and I've got what was three again. And for four questions, not too big of a deal. But if I get into it more, I'm going to be having a hard time. What was two again? And I have to go back. And I can't just look up there. I've got to go all the way up to make sure I follow the right line and go across. Okay. Also, what about the text? It's really small. It looks like typewriter text on a computer, and that's always difficult to read. 1983. Hmm? 1983. What's wrong with 1983? What about this one? The questions aren't numbered, so it makes it hard to kind of follow which one goes. Yeah, at least they tab over here on this line, yeah. so you know that this isn't another question, but it's still kind of difficult. Their legend is here, but it's at the very bottom. I've got all my responses. Up. What's VLL? What the heck is that? And I have to read all the way to the bottom to get to the legend. Okay. It is lined up pretty nicely, but what could they do on this one to make it easier to read? And like Savannah was saying, to follow the lines across. Put the legend at the top. Put the legend at the top. Okay. What did you say, Kira? It's crowded. It's crowded. What could they have done to ease some of that? Yeah, you see, these don't even line up. This question, I think it's supposed to go here. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't line up. And if they associate the, the answers with the legend, then they don't have to have that crowded wording at the top. Mm -hmm. What could they do here to make this one easier to read? Could you use like the work points, like the like little circles for their numbers that have the um, lettering with them? So each one has that information defined. So you have, instead of the one, you have like a, a bullet point. And it says VL, or, and so they're able, as they're answering the question, they can look over and say, okay, this is. So, like here, you have a, a bullet point and a VL, and here a bullet point and there an L, and here or a bullet like point. Or under it. Or under so it. It's not, not so then you're making. <laughs> I, I think I know what you're saying. It's more aesthetically. I know what you're saying, but then, so, so here, have the bullet point VL, bullet point L, bullet point S, bullet point G, bullet point VG, mm -hmm. like that. Then you double the length mm -hmm. of it, which makes it look even longer. What about every other line? Mm -hmm. You do like the highlighted box behind it. That helps you see that they're lining up. Mm -hmm. I would, again, put the legend up at the top. What about that one? It's actually not too bad because I've got the range here, and I know what time you uh, what time you usually arrive. I know where to put the check. Okay, I wouldn't do the dots underneath there. I would do actual lines and make them line up for the open-ended questions. Might want to put some instructions up at the top. Font's a little hard to read. The thing you got to think about is bigger fonts are easier to read, but they do take up more space.
But if you tell me my survey is six pages and the font I'm looking at is 14 point times versus 12 point times, six pages of 14 point time, okay, I'm no math genius, <laughs> said in a quantitative research class, but I know that's going to be less than if it's 12 point time or 10 point time. Then your collection of data, analysis of data, and presentation of the data. Are you going to collect it face to face? Are you going to do the pen and paper, or the interview? Are you going to do it mediated over the phone? Oops, sorry. You print or online? Why would you do face to face? What would be the benefit of face to face? Guarantees completion. Guarantees completion. Okay. Or if you do the interview and you're asking the questions that way, what's the downside to it? They may not be as honest. They may not be as honest. Okay. I don't know, I guess they might feel more pressured. They might feel more pressured, so they may try and be figuring out what it is you're looking for and give your response. Are you going to do 2,000 face-to-face interviews? And even if you do, say you want to go to Walmart and get 2,000 interviews, are you going to be able to get a random sample of Warrensburg? No. Because you're going to, it's going to be a convenience sample. And there your randomness is thrown out and it's, you're not going to be able to generalize it. Okay. Mediated would be whether you, whether you go through the random digit dialing and you call them, uh, the print, you send via uh, the mail or online. Or, I'm sorry, through an email or an online where you use like SurveyMonkey or one of those uh, survey builders and you're running through that way. Okay. Now you're losing the face to face and forcing them to complete it, but because you're doing it in a mediated fashion, you can guarantee that you're sending it to a random sample. Everybody had a chance to respond, and as long as you get a decent response rate, everybody's had the same opportunity. For your analysis, you're obviously going to use statistical analysis. It's a quantitative study. You have to use statistics. There's the descriptive data that's like the frequencies, mean, mean, median, and mode. Or the inferential, where you're going to be looking for differences. Or you use a teeth test, a one-way ANOVA, a factorial ANOVA. Um, you can look at a, a, a chi-square. Or you try to find similarities, where you're looking at correlations or regressions. Is there some correlation between, men, between gender and the level of usage of text messaging. So those are the stats we'll be talking about this semester. And then finally, your presentation of data. First of all, it's going to depend on your audience. Are you writing this for a journal, or are you presenting it at a conference? If you're presenting it at a conference, you're going to have to give it very succinctly. You're going to want to use a lot of graphs, a lot of tables. If you're doing it for print, you can still use the graphs and tables, but you're going to need to detail a little bit more of what you found. And if you want to look at the Gallup and the Pew Research polls, there's a couple of examples of when you get the data and what it looks like. All right? Questions? Comments? Thoughts? Yes, sir? One question. Mm -hmm. Going back to um, when we were talking about the purpose of the study, uh -huh. on, you know, because like you were saying, you don't want to be too specific with the purpose of the study because it might skew the thought process of people taking the survey and just saying, well, no, I don't act that way, or I don't listen to that kind of music, or refer to women in that language. Right. So is there a way of just dis designing or describing your purpose of study so as it doesn't maybe lie to them or flaw? Yeah, you don't want to mislead your audience. You don't want to mislead them as you're developing your study, but you just don't give all of this. This is a study looking at the language used in men's magazine advertising. Then, well, what are we talking about with that language? Now, are you talking about, you're, you're looking to see, does the language appear sexist in men's magazines? Um, is it neutral? Is it aggressive? Is it um, macho? You know, what kind of language are you using? Rather, you're just saying, this is a study to examine people's perceptions of the language used in men's magazines. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 